Hello, everyone. Um, I think I can speak for the group assembled on screen that we're so glad to be here and that you can join us. My name is Brooke Epley. I am currently serving as the SVP of Strategy, Partnerships, and Innovation at ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. For those of you not working in the music industry, ASCAP is a 106-year-old organization that operates on a not-for-profit basis, which collects song performance royalties on behalf of 700,000 songwriters and music publishers in the United States. I'm here today wearing my hat as a creator and leader of the ASCAP Lab, an innovation initiative that ASCAP launched in late September 2019. A year in, we've completed our first early stage uh, seed project in conjunction with the New York City Media Lab, which you'll hear more about today. Brought on Vernon Reed as our artist in residence, who is the guest we are honored to have with us today. Um, <laughs> hosted a couple of speaker events on innovation themed topics. Our next one is on October 15th with Hod Lipson speaking on artificial intelligence. And there's much more to come. Uh, given the theme of today's summit on creativity and innovation, we thought it would be really interesting to bring a couple of the teams from our C project together with Vernon Reed to have a conversation about creativity and its role in innovation from various vantage points. Before we do further introductions, I want to set the stage by spending a couple of minutes giving you a sense of our experimental seed program. So to do that, we'll share a short video that provides a quick overview of the program and the team's projects. ASCAP Lab is ASCAP's innovation initiative, which we created just under a year ago to develop new technology, talent, business approaches, and partnerships to create value for music creators, ultimately with the aim of differentiating ASCAP as the future forward PRO for creatives. We've kickstarted a number of projects as part of this initiative, including funding a seed stage project with the New York City Media Lab, the lab sponsored an 11-week open university challenge for graduate students and faculty in music, design, and technology to reimagine how we might leverage and combine developments in disciplines such as machine intelligence, extended reality, voice-controlled user interfaces, and object detection, to name a few, to rethink the ways we can create or experience music. Ultimately, out of many applicants, we provided grants to five teams who developed some very ambitious projects. What was sort of your motivation or inspiration for taking on this project? With the Chiller, what we want to do is to detect and visualize big moments of musical emotion, of pleasure in real life environments. A lot of the tools out there for making music, you still have to like overcome a technical barrier. Like we just want people to just like enter this like interface and just like move around and kind of just use what they have and not really like think about the technical challenges. Octavia is envisioning a future where music is immersive, interactive, and embodied. There's visual albums, live albums, virtual concerts, and more and more after COVID, this is kind of something that we really need to focus on and bringing it into a more immersive and enjoyable experience is a huge motivation for us. First of all, our, our team was brought together by our passion for music and a strong interest in using emerging technology to explore innovative ways to compose and experience music. So we believe that everyone has their own musical creativity inside, even with no musical background. And we also believe that uh, everything has its own inner voice of music. So we imagine a world where sound and our hands blend together in a device that allows for a more natural interaction. We want it to be playful to incite joy and discovery. We want it to be musical to make sure that we're creating something harmonic and melodic. We wanted something to be design oriented so they could make a statement. And finally, something universal so that can be played by lots of people. This was actually the first program that we've run that was entirely virtual from start to finish. The spirit and energy of the work you're doing is really uh, inspiring to me. And I'm excited about today. I'm excited about seeing your work. This is the best review we've ever got in our life. It was like totally collaborative and it, it was just a really awesome experience. Being able to bounce ideas with you guys in so many different angles, that was that was vital, I think. It was very obvious that we can 
achieve something really nice together. Our team's yeah. interests are very well aligned with the goals that the program is trying to accomplish. ASCAP is not only investing in the future of music, we are creating it. By promoting innovation, ASCAP will support our songwriter and publisher members' ventures to reimagine music. And here with us today are representatives of two of the teams, Pablo Ripolles of Team Chillers and David Azar of Mad for Midi. Um, Pablo, do you want to spend a minute or two to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, my name is Pablo Ripollés. I am a professor in the Department of Psychology and the Department of uh, Music and Performance Arts and Professions in NYU. And uh, are we, a team of researchers from these departments and also from MARL and from the Center for Language, Music and Emotion, CLAIM, have developed this, <laughs> which is a wearable device capable of uh, detecting goosebumps. We all love music and when we listen to music and we have a peak moment of pleasure, we have these things that we identify as chills or shivers down the spine. And these chills many times come with a physiological reaction, that is goosebumps. We have a little device based on the Raspberry Pi architecture that is able to track uh, these uh, peak moments of emotion and provide biofeedback, which basically lighting up an LED uh, strip when somebody is feeling a big moment of emotion from, from music. The rest of the team uh, are Dana Bevilacqua, Michal Goldstein, and Claire Perofi. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pablo. Um, and David, uh, please take a minute to tell us who you are and your involvement in the SEED project. Sure. Uh, thank you all so much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is David Azar. I'm a recent graduate from the ITP NYU program. Sorry, the NYU ITP program. Uh, we focused a lot on engineering and technology around music and creativity. Uh, together as a team, we created the MAD Sampler, which is a voice and audio recorder and editor that uses a non-traditional interface for experimentation. Our team is made up of four designers, engineers, and technologists who are extremely passionate about product design, musical exploration, and innovation. And at the beginning of this program, we tasked ourselves with creating a self-contained device with a new interface to break away from the traditional piano-like layout that we see in most electronic musical instruments in some days. And during this summer, we worked together with ASCAP and the New York City Media Lab to create our vision of that, which we'll share with you in a sec. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, and last, but most certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Vernon Reed who is the solo artist and lead guitarist for renowned rock group Living Color, which debuted to massive critical acclaim in 1988 with the album Vivid, including the Grammy-winning hit Cult of Personality. Um, this may date me a bit, and I've never told Vernon this, uh, but I associate that song with a roller skating rink I used to go to on Saturdays in the late 80s. <laughs> Perhaps not the association most people have, but I think it's a great example of the song staying power after all these years. Um, Living Color would go on to release Time's Up in 1990 and Stain in 1993 before temporarily disbanding in 1995. Vernon Reed released his first solo record in 1996, Mistaken Identity, and has gone on to record and release albums with a variety of collaborators, including DJ Logic and Mask. Uh, he is an active session artist and producer, including work on two Grammy-nominated albums, Papa in 1999 by the African vocalist Salif Keita and Memphis Blood, The Sun Sessions in 2001 by guitarist James Blood Ulmer. In addition to serving as artist in residence with the ASCAP Lab, Reed continues to record and tour with Living Color and currently appears on Bruce Hornsby's latest album, Non-Secure Connection. Uh, I'll add that on a personal note, I've had the opportunity to brainstorm and collaborate with Vernon Reed over the course of the year, and it has been such a pleasure trading ideas and musing on things to come or things that should be. Uh, Vernon is such a creative thinker and really has his finger on the pulse of, of now. Uh, we're really lucky to have his involvement in the ASCAP lab. So Vernon, before we kick things off, how are you doing? 
Um, I'm thank you, Brooke, for that wonderful introduction. I'm I'm doing as well as anyone in a dystopian hellscape can <laughs> be doing. Um, it's it's a it's a challenging time at the moment. Uh, t- as as a person who loves to play live as well as in the studio uh, and really enjoys working with all kinds of musicians and all kinds of artists. Um, it is a very challenging time. A lot of things have gone virtual. Um, in this time period, I was able to work with George Clinton on a song and uh, I, I completed work on a documentary um, directed by Brad Lichtenstein, uh, and, and it's a really cool film. And uh, one of the producers on that film, is Snoop Dogg, is one of the executive producers of this film called When Claude Got Shot, which is about uh, gun violence in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and, you know, I've worked with the director Brad on a number of projects, including a, an Oculus, uh, a kind of a virtual uh, film that that's partly animated that was made for the uh, Oculus uh, VR a VR film, which was centered around Arthur Ashe. I think it's Arthur Ashe '68, and when Arthur Ashe, um, you know, it, it's it, anyway, anyway. All that to say, I've been involved in technology my entire career. You know, ver, you know, a lot of the technologies visa you know, through the guitar and. If, played all different types of uh, effects and guitar synthesis and have stayed involved. In fact, I recently have been working, doing custom presets for Native Instruments and as well as um, for Line 6 uh, for new, new products or new iterations of products that are, that are just being released now, I think uh, Native Instruments 13 Complete has just been released. And uh, the next version of the Helix platform um, software is, is about to come out. Um, I think I might have busted up my NDA, but <laughs> oops. Oh, well. <laughs> Trade secrets. No, but um, no, it's, it's, uh, I, it's been... Uh, Interesting and fascinating to see what technology, changes in technology and musical expression, the way and the story of technology in music is, is really a fascinating one. And it's an ongoing one. Um, you know, we went from, from really just one track recording, mono recording, to stereo recording, to 24 track and multi track recording. And, and what's happened? is now uh, kids are selling beats that they're, that they're making on their phone, beats that they're making in GarageBand, and beats that they're doing on, iP- on, on, on their iPad. In fact, I believe there's an artist that was nominated or won a Grammy, and they, they did all the engineering on their iPad. So we're going through a crazy uh, time. But at the same time, vinyl records, which you would have thought would have totally disappeared, vinyl records like with the tenacity of the cockroach, vinyl records still exist. And so it's a fascinating and very strange time to be a creative person in music and in multimedia. Yeah. Would you say that, I mean, it sounds like you've been very busy. (laughs) Um, You know, how do you think COVID and the pandemic has affected your creative process? Well, uh, What's interesting is that for a lot of artists, you know, this lockdown thing, a lot of, you know, my compatriots, we've, all, we've already, we don't have regular jobs, you know, so a lot of us have been in lockdown, uh, you know, in our various lab, audio laboratories and studios and, uh, and caves, uh, you know, uh, non-gender specific caves. So, uh, you know, so a lot of, we have a lot of alone time, but we also have the catharsis of playing live, you know, we, of, of, of going on tour and playing locally and all those. And that's the part of it that's been taken away and has changed the nature of, collab, of, of collaboration. 
and that's the and I, and I know a lot of writers and other creative people as well, filmmakers and 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 people in my crowd were all thinking, okay, so what's the ne you know what's next or what if I mean, what if concerts don't come back? What how long is this going to go on? And there's a lot of anxiety around it, and that can be a a, a kind of fuel for creativity, but you, but also there's an opportunity for centering and stillness that's afforded to us now to really stop and think because there's a kind of tyranny of anytime you meet somebody you got to have ten projects that you're doing. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And this is a time where you we could drop that. We could maybe drop that. And it's and it's actually okay to say you know what I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know what's next. And out of that, new things will come out of those spaces that we create for ourselves. Yeah, sometimes the constraints imposed upon us by, you know, um, social distancing or any other kinds of constraints can create new possibilities around the creative process. Uh, ASCAP actually just went through, the, we're, we're piloting this um, workshop on creativity um, the Lulu and Leo fund has this workshop called choose creativity and it's about um, creativity as a mode of certainly as a mode of artistic expression but also as an act of um, as a constructive act rather than a destructive act and uh, each there's 10 sessions that they do and each one has a theme and they have these principles of creativity and I think they're really it's kind of a powerful list um, you know, authentic, resourceful, curious, unconventional, patient, expressive, intuitive, present, inventive, and inspired. And all of these, all of these traits, I think, during um, these past few months, as we've had to kind of quarantine, um, can create new opportunities to, to really have a rich creative period. You know, it's been funny. I, I've been watching on YouTube some of David Lynch has does, has done these lectures talking about meditation and uh, did, listening to different filmmakers. Another, another person who's really great is Guillermo del Toro. And Guillermo del Toro did a, 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 an interview with Alec Baldwin. And it was, it was so inspiring because he's, it, it's just kind of like, well, he talks about how much he loves the monsters that he creates and how we, He's so fascinated, and he just keep and he goes into these rabbit holes, and because he's like largely self-taught as a filmmaker, he created this whole, you know, it, it's it's incredibly inspiring. And not to say that the institu institutions all have their place, of course they do, but the idea of people going down the rabbit, figuring out, testing, experimenting, being less concerned with the efficacy of the end result. Creating accidents, creating happy accidents and collisions. Like that's kind of how, that's how hip hop started. That ha that's how so many different things came into being. Like, uh, like the 808 drum machine. I love the story about how the 808 drum machine was a product that failed. Basically, Roland was trying to sell the 808 drum machine and it, it was very, really expensive and they weren't moving them. And so they were blowing them out on 48th Street. 48th Street was a music district that no longer exists. Boo hoo. Anyway, they were blowing them out. They're blowing them out for like dropping them from like 500 to about 200 bucks. And that made them affordable for, you know, African Bombarda and the, and the people from Soul Sonic Force to pick them up. And they changed the course of music history. I mean, play at your own risk, you know, came out of this thing. So. Anyway, blah, 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 wolf. <laughs> well, you know, that, it's interesting because you, you mentioned earlier the kind of, you know, you've been in the music business for 30 plus. Good years. gosh almighty. <laughs> and, you know, you've seen an incredible evolution take place, um, including things like the 808 drum machine. And mm -hmm. do you have any, any sense of how you think things will evolve in the next few years or um, maybe the most exciting piece of music tech that you've seen recently. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, I think that um, 
Like there's different techno different softwares that I like. Like I'm an Ableton Live user, and you know for a long time Ableton was considered to be a DJ toy. You know when it started out, it was not considered to be a serious thing, and then it just you know the company kept adding features and making you know and making advances, and now Ableton is Ableton Live. Is a DAW that has gained a lot of respect. You know, it's not at the same level of a Pro Tools, but a lot of creative people. You know, it's easy to do a lot of creative things with Ableton, whereas with a lot of other DAWs, there are a lot of. In, in other words, like if you want to work with MIDI and audio, nothing is easier to work with than Ableton Live because Ableton Live is essentially the same product as it was when it was version one. It just added features, but the essential nature of it hasn't changed. Whereas with other products, they go through the thing where they make the product, the product was great, and then they make the product super complicated. Like I was a Cubase guy. I loved Cubase and Cubase VST. And then Cubase became, oh my God, what happened to this? And Logic was super complicated. Oh, Logic, yeah. I, Logic was a nightmare. It's funny how you're touching on something that's interesting. There's an inertia to... Like you start out with something that makes sense, but then you layer on and layer on and then suddenly it's so complex. I remember, I mean, this was probably 20 years ago now, but I was trying to make something within logic and I was struggling and struggling with it. And then finally someone pointed out, oh, you just have to tick this box, which was buried in, in like three different menus. And then everything worked. <laughs> but it, It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And now, now that, you know, it was, uh, logic was acquired by Apple and they have this other software GarageBand which is very simple and the thing that's cool is that you can start a project in GarageBand and then open it in Logic and then kind of add the complications that you want from that so different things have, have developed and changed over over time a lot of it's funny because just like in evolution you know a lot of designs are tried Many of them fail, and then a few things, for whatever reason, a few apps, products, softwares, you know, uh, the same thing with uh, social um, programs, you know, um, social programs, social media programs, um, things become sticky. I'm, I remember when people discounted Twitter, completely discounted Twitter. Twitter is, you know, what, blah, blah, blah. People used to snark. Like old media used to snark on Twitter all the time. And then the Arab Spring happened, and then the whole thing flipped. The whole thing flipped. And unfortunately, the Arab Spring was also crushed, but then Twitter became something that everyone had to take seriously. And now we take it seriously because the president uses Twitter all the time. So, you know, so it's, it's weird how, like, MySpace, I thought MySpace was cool, you know, and uh, nobody, you know, but MySpace still exists. It may, be, it may come back. <laughs> um, well, so just on this idea of, you know, future tech, like, what's next? Maybe this is a good time to switch to the teams and the two um, representatives that we have on the call. Um, uh, you know, how, let's see, let, let's take uh, David first. How did you come up with your idea? And maybe for, for the folks watching, um, you can describe you know, what you actually built and, and so on. Sure, I wanna say it wasn't a, a me thing. It's 100% a team effort. Our team is made of, of Matt Ross, Dana Elkis, Arnav Chakravati, and myself. And we approached this problem. Uh, we approached the problem that we felt the electronic music instruments are very limited in their interfaces. Uh, today you have your keys, you have your knobs, you have your buttons. And aside from a few distinct products like a Roly or a few products by Teenage Engineering, you have really no, I mean, there's a few others more niche like the Linstrument. And uh, if you keep going, there's a huge, huge amounts of, of things like the Hacking Continuum. But you either find that they're either too expensive or too complicated, you know, maybe a few of those might be $5,000, definitely not an entry level tool for a lot of people. And we felt that the available technologies were very limiting in terms of, um, uh, of allowing people to be more exploratory. So 
I'm gonna, I just wanna share a screen super briefly to paint a picture of our, our, of our idea. So we created this um, sampler, audio sampler and editor that has a very large silicone based surface at the very front. And by using the yellow uh, recording button, the one you see there, you can record a five second sample. And we wrote uh, algorithms that would split that and we'll lay it on the pad. And you would be able to modify those sounds by pressing harder on the silicone or moving your hands in different ways. Uh, just to see everything, this was made with uh, off the shelf components and open source technologies. We used Ableton to prototype some of the sounds and we used a tool called uh, Pure Data to build our uh, audio engine, which uh, pure data is very similar to what Max MSP is nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but yet yeah, the, the thesis that we had is how do we approach the problem of limited expressivity with affordable off the shelf components with a low entry level so that, you know, musicians can become technologists and technologists can become musicians. And that's how we approach the problem. And we, we went back and forth with so many ideas at first we wanted to create just a standalone MIDI interface but we realized that we wanted to build a self-contained device that would pr provide the experience of a whole product from like, like an end-to-end -end thing. And that was the approach that we took and coming back and forth with ASCAP and our mentors at the New York City Lab and our fellow teams in the, ho the cohort, uh, going back and forth, having those sessions, so those feedback sessions was a tremendous opportunity and something that shaped the product. That, you, that I think was particularly remarkable about your team's uh, project was that you guys started from literally scratch. Yeah. You, know, you built a full prototype during the 11 week program. Um, and you, and to do that, you had to build a sensor, like a new kind of sensor from scratch. And I just think um, that's not to be, um, it would be easy to, to not realize like the, the depth of, of work that you guys do did to get to where you were. And um, so anyway, I just was really impressed with that. Um, uh, so, so Vernon, as a, as a working musician, what's your reaction to this, uh, the, the thing that they made, um, any questions you might have for them and so on? Well, okay. So, so this is a sampler. It is. That has a control that has basically a silicon pad on top mm -hmm. and, and by using pressure, you can affect, you could change what the sample does. Like you can affect different parameters or does it have effects built in or does it or can it does it utilize say the effects in like Ableton no it's a standalone thing so it's standalone every, totally standalone yeah, okay everything is we used Ableton to prototype you know it's easier to get started with that okay and then we moved it to here uh, this thing is adding three effects so we have a chorus a change of pitch and a low pass filter okay and one of each of these is mapped to a different dimension on the pad so if you press and you move left and right, you add or, or remove cores, right? If you press and move up and down, you, you switch up or down the pitch. And if you press harder or softer, you add or remove, or you basically change the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter. Right, so, so my initial reaction is, this is dope. Um, it might, reminds me of the Sensel Morph, the Sensel yep. Morph, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, and, uh, uh, it's interesting as it's uh, standalone. You can record. Do you record audio into it? You can record audio into it. Obviously, it's standalone, right? So, yep. so number one, my first reaction is immediately I want a lot more effects. Yep. Like I want a ring modulator. I want delay. I want, you know what I mean? I'm, like it, ma it makes me think because my imme immediate reaction is I'm re I'm into it. Um, and it's got implications. It's got all kinds of implications. Like, say, I was just thinking about sound design and in a medium like podcasting, mm -hmm. where uh, you could have somebody speak, like sample, you know, you could sample yourself speaking and affect your voice in real time. Yep. Um, the one question I have is, okay, so, could this also work as a as a foot pad? In, in in other words, could say if I'm playing guitar, if I, if I want to affect things and have my hands free, 
Mm -hmm. And I get the fact that, you know, if I press on one corner or another corner, I'm going to affect a certain, certain thing. So, like, I think, oh, I would want one of these on the floor so that I can put my foot on it and have a different thing. That it's like, it's different than having an expression pedal, right? It's like, it's the thing is built into it, right? So just by moving my foot around, I can affect things or what have you. If, I'm, if somebody's playing trumpet and mm -hmm. they have it, and they have a di it's different than like, uh, okay, so Miles had a wah-wah pedal and everybody got mad, you know what I mean? And, and this is kind of like, okay, so the next generation, like some young horn player connects to something like this. And then because of the fact that it's silicon and, and they're, the, the pressure they put on changes, that's different than Wawa because Wawa is just a rocker. And mm -hmm. it's expressive. It's very expressive. I mean, Hendrix and Miles and a whole bunch of other people, Wawa Watson, you know, they were able to, to just by the speed and whatever, they got a lot of awesome sounds. You know, I think about like, um, like sort of formant filtering and things like that. Um, so on the one hand, I could, I could see it as a, as a, as a plat basis for sampling, of course. Mm -hmm. But then I turn around and go, oh man, this could have implications because of the fact that it's not just a switch and it's not a rocker pedal. It's like you move your foot on it and, it's, and, and you have that kind of feeling to it. Mm -hmm. The way people affect the things that they're affecting will change in a fundamentally different, different way. So that's, those are the like immediate mm -hmm you know what I mean, impressions I get is that you not only create a, created a, a device, you also created a, a, a new kind of, uh, it, it's like a platform, it's like a device, but it's also a platform, in other words. You know, it, it, it could be utilized as a kind of effect, not just, you know, for sampling, but not to take it away from your initial intention, but mm -hmm. that's, the, that's part of the thing is we want devices that don't just prescribe what to do with them, but allow for happy accidents and the yeah. unintended thing, the unintended thing that is super dope and super cool. It's like... The beautiful oops. The yeah, beautiful, the beautiful oops. Yeah. That's a that's a great way of putting it. So, I look at it and go, "Oh man, don't stop there." You know, like like. Oh, we won't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, the first time Cord came out with the Chaos Pad, right? Mm -hmm. And the Chaos Pad is is you know it's a kind of control surface, and you and you can affect things by swiping your your finger around. And when the first time I said saw that, I said, "Oh, you should make one one of those the size of a dance floor." You should make an entire dance floor. You should take everything that you're doing with this and then scale it up mm -hmm. and then have an entire dance floor. That's a chaos pad. <laughs> and, that, and, and you're talking about changing the, the, the concept of DJing it becomes a whole other thing. Now, you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> as typical of my wildly impractical notions. I love it. I'd go to that dance floor. <laughs> you know what I mean? But imagine you went to a club and actually you could have an effect that like if people, if, say people are forming a circle, someone's really getting, getting their groove on, you could focus, you could change what happens mm -hmm. to the music by what they're doing in that particular area of the floor. But we're talking about a lot of money and a lot of R&D for a thing that's, you know, well, before we um, switch to Pablo and, and talking about Team Chillers, um, Daveed, one final question for you. Um, yeah. You know, in your wildest dreams, we, we were just thinking very big, you know, the size of a dance floor big. Um, but, you know, in your wildest dreams, um, you know, what, what are your hopes for your project's ultimate impact? It's a great question. Um, and the answer touches a bit on what uh, Vernon was just saying. We had a lot of internal, ar not arguments, but uh, discussions within our arguments team. Arguments are fine, bro. <laughs> we fought with each other. <laughs> now, uh, we, we were trying to find the division, right? Because we saw this uh, potential seed of an idea going many multiple ways. Uh, changing uh, sound live was one of them, definitely. 
you know, being able to mostly with, with vocals, we, we thought about it that way, you know, being able to change the, the, the effects of a mic live with all your fingers was one of the ideas. The, the, but the idea, the, the direction I think where we see this in our wildest dreams is to create um, an experience, not so much, it's not so much about the product, but it's about the experience of being able to have this thing on your backpack or on your pocket, depending on the size, and just being able to take it out, record something that you see on the, that you hear on the street. Mm -hmm. And, you know, music is about that bubble and that personal space that only you and the music and the people you play with can provide. So if the whole world becomes your stage and you can record any piece of music, any piece of sound, and then change it live and add more effects and save them and share it with more people and the thing becomes more of a platform and a shared experience with people you don't even know, that's, that would be super interesting. And uh, honestly, it's very exciting to us. It's something I want to use and I want others to use. And the, teams feel, the team feels the same way. Is that is your is your uh, device is that are you thinking about doing anything like via Kickstarter or something like that? It's uh, we we com commercially. Yeah, we we've uh, we've uh, we're starting to go down that path. Uh, as of right now, the features the feature set that we chose and the form factor and maybe the material the silicone is you know for in terms of uh, of uh, robustness might not be the best way to go forward. It's really hard to keep it clean. You know, we've, we've learned so many things by going through this process and innovation is an iterative process. But I feel that once we, we find that, you know, that robust MVP, minimum viable product, we will, we're very interested in, in, in launching this. It's, there's so many channels to this nowadays um, and many forms of funding. Uh, Kickstarter is certainly one of them, for sure. We wanna, we wanna put it in the hands of more musicians to get Amazing feedback. I, I, I want one. <laughs> oh, I'll give you one myself. <laughs> we can we can make sure that we can arrange that. So definitely, that would be um, So so, uh, the Mad by Team MIDI uh, device kind of represented the um, you know the side of the challenge, which was to rethink how we create music. Um, Team Chillers answered the other side of the challenge, which was how can we change how we experience music. Um, and so, Pablo, do you want to, you know, spend uh, a minute just telling us a little bit more about your project and what was the genesis for the idea was and what you're trying to accomplish with it? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, um, we, like, I'm, I'm a researcher uh, and uh, part of what I do is to study the reward system in the brain, right? So, how our brain processes rewarding stuff. And uh, music is something that everybody finds rewarding, everybody finds pleasurable, but it's like a very special thing, right? It's very particular to each of us. And it's a thing that, that I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by the fact that the same pattern of sounds can be incredibly pleasurable for one person and totally the opposite for another. Uh, I always use the same example. Uh, among the many things that I like about music, I love bagpipes and, uh, and I'm listening to bagpipes and I'm having chills and goosebumps and then and my wife is looking at me going like, what is this? <laughs> what is this noise, right? So the origin of, of, of chillers is because we really want to understand better how is it possible that the pattern of sounds uh, has uh, this huge effect on us, on human beings, and, on, on, and, and why is this so different from person to person, right? And we know how to do that. We know how to study uh, behavioral or physiological or brain reactions uh, in the lab, but but it's very it's very anticlimactic, right? You are in front of a computer, or you are connected to some electrodes, or you are inside of an MRI machine, and yeah, you, we can do that. But I always was bothered because I was like, this is not the way we listen to music. We listen to music while we dance. We listen to music while we are in a in a live show. And I want to know more about how do we react to music in the real world, right? So a year ago, I had this idea. I woke up one day and I was like. I got it. We are gonna measure goosebumps. We're gonna use a camera to record a patch of skin in the arm and we're gonna measure goosebumps because with many of the things that we use inside of the inside of the lab, the problem that we have is that the sensors, if you move, there is a lot of noise and then you can no longer detect anything. But with a camera, uh, we wouldn't have that problem. And I was like, okay, this is the best idea I've ever had in my life. And of course I went online and somebody had already done that. <laughs> So there is this professor, Matthias Benedek, who developed an algorithm that uh, 
can detect goosebumps from a recording of a patch of skin, right? The problem that they had is that this was something that was still connected to a computer, right? So then with the rest of the team, we started to think about how to turn uh, this into a wearable, into something portable that an affordable, even like a do-it-yourself kind of device that is open source, that uh, anybody can use, that anybody can create on, on their own. And uh, then we chose to use the Raspberry Pi architecture, which is this. This is a Raspberry Pi Zero. It costs $10, it's a mini computer, and uh, it has the capabilities of the first Xbox. So we attach a camera to that, and thanks to the, to the help of the ASCAP team and the New York City Media Lab team, uh, we were creating over the pandemic, and we ended up with this little thing here, which is portable, and uh, the moment it detects a goosebump, it lights uh, these uh, LEDs to share with everybody that uh, somebody is experiencing a, a peak of emotion. Now, I'm gonna very quickly share my screen. So this is a little, a little bit of a show that you put up with, uh, with one of my friends. I'm wearing the chiller on, on my arm and you will see on the top right, the patch of the skin, on the bottom right, the amplitude of the goosebump detected and how the LED lights up when I'm having a, a goosebump. watching you dance and getting really into the music. <laughs> so this is basically this is basically the device that, that we have created. For us, it's important because it gives us a new way to measure reward and emotion in, in real life. Um, the music tech aspect of this is that now we have developed an affordable device uh, that people can use in a concert to share their emotion in a, in a, in a natural way to provide some kind of biofeedback. And for us, it's also very important that we think that this also can be an educational project uh, to teach, for example, high schoolers about uh, com computer science, about neurophysiology, and about, about neuroscience. So Vernon, real quick, because we're almost out of time, what do you think? Like, is it useful to be able to detect goosebumps in, in performance? <laughs> so, okay, I, I think it's so, okay, so not to be snarky, but my immediate thought is that you know for uh it would be great for speed dating for speed dating <laughs> yeah like yeah <laughs> like each person puts on the thing and they meet and then you see you know it's like you see oh the reaction you know is is right there which i which you know some people may not want that so i think it's cool i think it's i think it's really interesting um Especially if you have, do you have colors? Okay, so here's the here's the question: Does is it able to change to different colors, or is it, does it just go? You you know, are you you have blue, green? Yes, yes, absolutely. So this is the the most basic thing that we have done, which is just light up as green. But actually, you can change colors. You can uh, show a pattern of different colors that change at different speed according according to the amplitude of the of the of the goosebump. You can also transmit that to a screen and then show the aggregated emotion by the by the audience or even by the performers. So you can turn the signal into whatever you want. That's really interesting. That's really yeah. huh. see again that's that's almost like if you're DJing. Right, say say you're DJing, and the flow of the evening. You want okay, so you want to create a blue moment, and you figured out okay, this track, this chill out track, does that, and then you could say okay, if see so you see the amplitude going down, you could maybe change your set. You could you know you could see what's going on, and then you could go oh you know what I need to shift. I need to go left or I need to go yes. right. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and that, that's, that's a, a kind of a pra a somewhat practical. And also, weirdly enough, you could use it for like sort of 
a DJ R and D, right? There's actual performance, but then say, you know, I want a, a test group, right? I want a test group. So yes. say you're a highfalutin, you know, DJ guy, right? You say, okay, I want to, you know, I've got a super big show coming up. But I, what I want to do, I've got a new set with some new joints. So I need to see how this is going to probably work. So then you have a bunch of volunteers. Say you have a, a hundred volunteers or 200 volunteers in a space. And, you know, you could try out your thing and then you can see from a small, you know, from a small uh, test group, you can go, oh, okay, this is working. I'm seeing red over here for this. Yeah. I'm seeing blue over here for that. I'm seeing yellow over here for that. You so do have a couple of projects coming up, don't you, Vernon? So, so maybe- It's so not maybe. just like, <laughs> well, it's just, it's just funny because the thing is that like you, you build something because you have the impulse to do it. And then it's like, you think, okay, well, this is the way it's going to be used. But then there's a bunch of other use cases that isn't, you know what I mean? That's not, absolutely, really, yeah. that's not front of mind because you're so focused. It's just like, like you think your song is working one way, right? So the songwriters go through this all the time. You think your song is working one way. You think your lyric is working one way. And then somebody comes at you and says, you know, this song is about blah to me. And you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, it, it, it's, it, there's, a, there's a great podcast called Ear Hustle. And it's, uh, Ear Hustle is, is, is basically cast from San Quentin. It's, it's, it's all about pr people that have been in prison and what have you. And one episode of Ear Hustle, they were talking about how they transfer prisoners on these buses. And there was a prisoner who, who was convinced that Hotel, the song Hotel California by the Eagles was about prison life. And, and, and it's, and, but when you hear how he interpreted it, he was very convincing. He was like this, that, and the other thing. All that to say, you know, you make a device for one thing and then it has a whole yeah. other, you know, for that matter, I mean, who knows? Like, say, you're in a restaurant, right? Because you, you get goosebumps for all kinds of, you get goosebumps. You know, you get goosebumps if your favorite food is brought out. Before yeah. you eat it, you're yeah. going to have goosebumps. So, you know, they're all kind of things. I, I'm, I'm just saying. It's cool. No, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very beautiful metaphor, the fact that we all... Uh give meaning to, to songs based on our own experiences. And this is also applied to our device because it's open source so people can use it for whatever. So as a matter of fact, you were saying uh, about testing this with 200 people. If Brooke is going to ask me, what is, what is your dream? That's my dream to test this with 200 people in a live audience and see what happens. Well, thanks so much um, to all of you for sharing, you know, for, for putting your creative energies into um, music in in various ways tackling it from a creative perspective or from a technology perspective the creation the experience of music um it's just really inspiring to see um you know how all of you approach um your work and it was nice to bring all of you together for this conversation so thanks thank you so much thank you so much it's been a pleasure thank you for having us